drugs, and the hope is very high that we get the result of that, cure cancer, but the reality is we haven't. Five year survival rates are still not very much better than they were decades ago. And the reason for that is that tumors find a way to get around target therapy. So what invariably happens is another of these signaling pathways, some of which I showed you during my talk, uh, well, cancer originally is due to A pathway becoming active when it should be active. You drive growth. And then if you block that pathway with one of these target therapies, and this is what we can now do because of this work over the last 40 years, what indirectly happens is another pathway, and there are many of so, uh, another pathway becomes active to compensate for the one which has been blocked. Uh, now, uh, the major challenge is to understand what are these compensatory pathways, how are they activated, and once they're activated, how do they actually compensate for the block ones? So we're kind of back to square one, uh, trying to understand what's going on in the case. That might be the <laughs> thing. I'd like to change gears completely now and ask Dr. Chibandan to tell us how our exposures to nutrients, we spoke about the exposure of yeast to nutrients and the signalings of those exposures by TOR, but how exposure to nutrients by mammals, namely diet, may play a role in these processes. Yeah, this is something that uh, Michael probably knows way more than I do, but the, the discovery that Michael had uh, made really is a nutrient sensing pathway where the cells have been, it has evolved where if you have enough nutrients you get to grow and then not enough nutrients, the cells know how to turn themselves off. So the real question is whether our diet somehow could influence tumor uh, formation, for example. So there's several areas that have been emerging in this. So we know that there's a big epidemic right now, which is called obesity. And this is due to a number of many different factors that we know about, but it is really an epidemic. And we know that combination between smoking and obesity accounts for about 30% of our cancer incidents. So the question is how do diets actually influence cancer in general? So obesity itself is thought that some of the pathway that's activated during obesity is signaling pathway that actually influences on TOR pathway. Um, there is a growth factor that's stimulated called insulin, like growth factor that goes up in obesity that stimulates cells, particularly cancer cells, to make them grow through the TOR pathway and other pathways. So that's one thing. The question is whether there are other um, dietary uh, manipulations that could affect cancer or not. And there's some emerging data right now in at least an experimental setting, is that if you restrict diets or undergo partial starvation that actually can prolong survival uh, with, with cancer. And that does really pinch on TOR again. Where um, if you, for example, like Michael didn't know whether you inhibit TOR separately, you can prolong the life of many animals. So that's a really fascinating uh, observation there. So there's a tie in between active metabolism and cancer development. So if you can slow that process down, you might be able to tamper down the development of cancer. Therapy. So those are kind of general concepts right now in the field. So unless you have anything else to add. I'm just wondering. If Historically, there used to be, this used to be an idea in the 30s and 20s, wasn't it? That this diet could be used to control, to control cancer. It was a starvation kind of diet. And, which is interesting, we're coming back to an old concept but with modern, modern underpinnings. Evolution hasn't changed, just our understanding. Yes, yeah. So there's still a lot more involved in this whole area. In fact, if you look at some of the current studies, if you were to give the same amount of calories right, to in an experimental setting, but you spread it over time rather than restrict it, this is in an experimental setting, the animals with an identical amount of calories will get fatter. So the timing of eating actually makes a big difference on your entire organism metabolism that can infringe on uh, tumor development as well. So this is the whole area that's been explored right now, whether time-restricted diet can slow down cancer development. Because there is 
this whole thing. And we go to sleep at night for a good reason. Because you know if you don't get a good sleep at night, what happens? You feel a like lousy in the next morning, right? Because our clock really times when you eat and go to sleep. And when this is deranged, and, and that ties in with diet as well, it can really shift the physiology and health and really either provoke cancer or diminish it. Many people with uh, night shift work, for example, have clearly increased risk for cancer because you shift the behavior as well as feeding cycle in that setting. So there's still a lot more work that needs to be done in this area. So, so, so we have increasingly good understanding of the entire clock. <coughs> And we have increasingly good understanding of the TOR pathways. Do they overlap them? They actually do. In mm -hmm. fact, if you look at the... This is No, this is amazing. <laughs> because if you look at where TOR is turned on, it's turned on only certain parts of the day, and then it gets turned off when the cells need to repair itself. So TOR drives growth, as you heard from, from Michael. But in all machinery, you need to clean it up. I mean, you have to clean up, you know, if you leave it up. So the cells know at a certain time of day to clean itself up, to re replenish itself the next day, right? So, when tor so there's part of the day where TOR is very active, and then it becomes very silent, where the cells repair itself. So this is And that's part of the nutrients of sensing um, role plus. So. And, and how is this how is this similar in yeast and yeast? Yeast, I know very little about. Might you hope know. But yeast has a very different cycle. I mean, it has very short cycle. It doubles every about 45 minutes, whereas our cells double every day. And so it has a very short cycle that kind of couples multiple cycles together there. But our system is a little bit different because we also get controlled by the clock in our brain as well. So, mm -hmm. uh, so yeast doesn't have the so called clock issue. No. Doesn't have clock. Doesn't have clock. Doesn't have clock. So does TOR take over the entire role of the transcendent? and the cycling therefrom? Uh, it doesn't. Well, you have to you have to think about what you mean by nutrients. Mm -hmm. and, uh, for a yeast cell, it's usually the nitrogen source. Yeah. 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 Amino acids. And, and they're, I think the nitrogen is the primary nutrient which is sensed by, by yeast and that impinges on it. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are other pathways which which also sends other nutrients or amino acids, but not in the same. I think it's fair to say TOR has a very central role because it senses what is the, the most important nutrient. So. As, as we were emailing back and forth over the last few weeks about this, about this panel, Bill Nelson brought up the point that there is a relationship between epigenetic change, diet, and development of new cancer therapies. I realize those are three very different areas to triangulate on, but if you would like to freewheel as much as you like in any of them. I think even, even freer than that, where this discussion is, is uh, drifting. Um, and you start out by asking, you know, what have we learned, or as Michael was trying to put all the pressure on you. Um, what have we learned about uh, cancer treatment resistance? Another way to look at it is, you know, amazingly enough, with empirically discovered anti-cancer drugs, we actually cured a few cancers. And another way to look at it is, how on earth did we do that? Um, you take Hodgkin's disease, how did we cure that? When we didn't know what we were doing, this was before all the genome sequencing, before we had a roadmap of what we might want to interfere with. How did we cure testicular cancer? Well, there are two things that both those cancers do or had or we should have been more aware of. One is that there are many, many more T lymphocytes, immune cells, that comprise these tumors than there are cancer cells. Hodgkin's disease, that big tumor is almost all normal T cells. Very few cancers. Testicular cancer, same thing. For a long time, people had trouble trying to figure out what the genetic defects are in the testicular cancer cells because there were so many normal lymphocytes around, they couldn't figure them out uh, because of overwhelmed by normal genomes. So now, of course, we recognize that what's happened is these T cells, immune systems are a remarkable thing, right? You can see an infected cell versus a non-infected cell with the virus. You can see Mary's uh, Clara's cells if they were transplanted in me versus my own. You can discriminate cell from that cell. And when it sees something that it doesn't like, the immune system can muscle up, generate many more T cells, and send them off. 
presumably to destroy the cells that you don't want. Um, so then why weren't all these cells there destroying the cancer cells? And of course, one of the great stories of the last few years is that those of you who have adolescent uh, daughters in particular, like I did, know about the talk to the hand response. When they arrive at the tumor, the tumor said, you know, leave me alone. Uh, Busy or something. <laughs> so, are not back. words at all. <laughs> Suppression of all further communication. And, and new new treatments that target that signal are the ones that have made immunotherapy exciting and involved and, and in that. We're not favoring one company against another because every company is making one. And it's had some miraculous effects for a small fraction of cancers across many places. But of course, this gets right back to what uh, Michael has spent his time working on, is how does a T cell decide what it's going to do when it arrives? If it uses the TORC1 kind of complex that he described for you, it needs to do that if it's going to make a whole bunch of copies of itself to muscle up a huge response to go and kill something. The same cells that can recognize the same defects, remember the immune system you want to remember that you encountered this abnormal viral infected cell. You get rid of TORC1 or you have much less of it, maybe even have TORC2 in it, influence, I don't know what the current thinking is. Uh, that will drive this memory response. And so now we're looking at TORC1 and TORC2 in the immune system. How does this react with what you've eaten in the diet, what your metabolic state is, what's going on broadly in the environment of the cancer, which has cancer cells and immune cells, and this evil brew that's enabling the cancer to grow in the test site. And how can we change the fate of T cells in the cancer by knowing this? So I'll throw this, uh, it's going to be the tradition here. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no clue, right? <laughs> if we have some outcome experts in the audience, you'll probably answer that better, better than I could. But this is, this is what, you, what you discuss is really the cutting edge. It's really the cutting edge. Where we have to well, one thing I get, one clarification I think we should add is that if you look at the DNA sequence that Mary Claire spent a lot of time studying, is that you can only read certain chapters off of those DNA sequences. Your brain cells can only read the brain chapters, muscle cells, so on. And these are marked by bookmarks. And these bookmarks, in fact, are all marked by metabolic signals that is just now becoming <coughs> operationalized in, in, the, in the world of, of pharmaceutical trials. And Webb Cavani, with support from National Foundation for Cancer Research, is very much involved in a major one of these for brain cancers. Good. Tell us what you can. I know it's very early days and it's not even publicly announced yet, but if you could tell us what you could, we would be honored. Yeah, so I, I, think, the, uh, I think the underpinnings of all of this has to do uh, with the genome project. So the genome project was you know, sequence as many tumors as you could, or as many humans as you could, and figure out where the targets are, as Michael was talking about. Um, what that's done is, is, is a couple of things. One is sort of intellectual masturbation, in that we can see all kinds of, uh, all kinds of mutations, we can put them in all kinds of pathways. Um, but the consequence of that has turned out to be that tumors are becoming separated into smaller and smaller groups. And the smaller and smaller the groups become, the clinical trials become harder and harder because of the number of patients that are needed. So for breast cancer, you know, we used to think of breast cancer was breast cancer was breast cancer. And we know that's not true. There are many, many different types of breast cancer, which is unfortunately, uh, each of those groups is relatively common. But many cancers, kidney cancer, uh, brain cancer, uh, pancreatic cancer, a variety of these are not uh, so common and as they get what we call groupified, they become a smaller and smaller group, which means that the trials which can be done are harder and harder to do because of patient overload. They take longer and longer. Um, the groups become more and more and more defined. Uh, and so how do you how do you actually do trials for these increasingly large number of uh, Also, any one, any one patient may belong to several different groups depending could on be, the could, nature of yeah, particular be, subset of the yeah. and, and the other issue is, of course, as the groups become smaller, the clinical trials can become less and less selective 
about who gets to be in that group, for example, uh, ethnic differences. Uh, so for brain tumors, for example, um, glioblastomas in particular, every patient essentially is put on a trial. There's no stratification, essentially, uh, because you have to take all comers, otherwise there's not enough patients. So um, getting trials done like that is very difficult because you take all kinds of patients, which means likely the signal will disappear in the noise, which is in fact what happens. Um, and then you, uh, you run a trial, patients all die, you do it all over again. And then you do it all over again. And, and I, I submit that that's probably not a very smart way to do things. So instead of that, what would be better is if you didn't have to rewrite the whole trial, re, re, uh, um, bring, bring in patients all over again uh, and do one drug and find out it didn't really work. Um, it would be better if you could do it all at one time. Write one master, master uh, protocol, which could have multiple arms, each of which was a different drug, which if they didn't, uh, if they weren't working on some sort of biomarker basis, in, this, in the case of uh, GPM, um, this, is, uh, this is radiology driven biomarkers. Define GPM. Uh, uh, blue blood cell multiple, most common rate, most lethal as well. One that Joe Biden's son died, uh, and so did Ted Kennedy. So th this um, this this disease it is a rapidly progressing lethal tumor. Virtually everybody dies. About fourteen thousand diagnoses of blue blood cell in the U.S. a year. Guess what? There's about fourteen thousand deaths plus one deaths. So we're not doing very well. Right? Even though we know a lot about the genetics. So clearly we need a different way to do this and we need a way, the drug companies have been great in the sense that they've developed lots of drugs against many of the defects in these tumors. Um, we can only test a couple a year. There's 50 of them. We know they don't work singly. So we have to do them in, in at least a double, combination, a double combination, which means 50 squared. That takes about 40 years. More patients than that. Yeah, it takes about 40 years because of the number of patients. It makes no sense. So we need a way to do this where we can we can run these um, and a, 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 a drug that's failing instead of the patient dying. We say, look at that, the drug didn't work. We can actually put them onto a different line of, of therapy um, and get rid of that drug that isn't working, right? Or bring in a new drug. But we don't want to have to write the protocol, those three years of writing the protocol, including the patients, over and over and over and over again. I mean, it doesn't take very much, very, very much smarts to realize that's not the way to go forward. Moreover, it's very expensive. So to develop one of these drugs is about $1.2 billion per drug. Okay? The drug companies are under enormous pressure from, uh, from various of the White Houses. Uh, about the expense of drugs. Patients can't pay $200,000 for a drug and add another one, $400,000 for a drug, which probably won't work because the trials weren't tested to do that. So what, do you, what can you do? They're, they're under pressure to bring the cost down. The cost of development, there's all kinds of polit political parts here, but the cost of development are what they are under the system that we have now. But if you could shorten the system by years, you could actually reduce the cost of drugs. And so the trial that, that we, we've set up, and there are a variety of people in the audience who are involved with this, uh, NFCR has been one of the founding uh, funders of this, um, are, are set up to do exactly that. That is to be, to be, um, to be set up so that there's a single master protocol, every drug is an appendix, that's approved by the FDA, of course. But that appendix approval is very rapid compared to going through all the statistical part of the trial. And, and then the, the, this can go on. So it's essentially a learning system that evolves over and over and over and over until we actually have a cure for the patients. And it puts the patients in the middle of the trial. They are the center of the trial. They're not just the subject. And I think that, um, that, that holds an enormous amount of promise. Now, the FDA has been very uh, proactive in, uh, in working with us on this. In fact, so proactive that the trial 
which started to be a randomized phase two trial for the aficionados, has now been agreed to be uh, a, a seamless uh, transition from that randomized early stage phase two trial to a phase three registration trial. And, and one patient might be on several different drugs in the course of the Absolutely. trial. Absolutely. And a different patient who started on the same drug might take a different path. Might well be. Depending different. on the radiation response. That's right. So uh, anyway, so that, that uh, is back to the FDA for final approval. Patients will start accruing um, uh, in the U.S. and China and Australia. Uh, we're talking to Australia, uh, sorry, to Israel uh, and, and Europe and Brazil. So it will be pretty, pretty broad, capture a lot of patients, which means that many drugs can actually go through many. Uh, there's been uh, serious conversations with many drug companies about putting drugs into these trials uh, with a great deal of interest, as you, as you, as you might imagine, uh, because of the savings of money in that case, but also the rapidity of getting a yes-no answer, which is really what you want in, in, this kind of, in this kind of disease. What has been the role of the National Foundation for Cancer Research in the trial? So the, the National Foundation has been involved, really, from the very beginning, uh, uh, both in, in two different ways. One, one is in providing some monies to, uh, to get the to get the protocol ready for uh, uh, for a reading by the FDA, uh, and the second is that Sujan has been really the spearhead for getting this going in China. So China has a, a lot of a lot of interesting features. That those of you who've been to China know that. Um, one of the features is not cooperation. Most of the hospitals are intensely uh, con intensely competitive. Um, but that being said, most of the patients with this disease in China, uh, instead of being seen in 200 or, or 250 institutions, are seen in seven. So there's seven hospitals which have a majority of neurosurgical issues. Now, some of these hospitals have 5,000 neurosurgical beds, for example. 5,000 neurosurgical beds is more than the state of California. Uh, or, or probably more than the Western United States, each one. Uh, those are all not just brain tumor beds, of course. But uh, so most of these patients are seen in a single place by a single team of people. Um, and Sujan has been working for the past couple of years in trying to get um, in trying to get this to form a, a consortium um, which will abide by common rules and common. Uh, uh, protocols and ethics and uh, data sharing and all, all of the parts that go into that, um, which has been really a remarkable sociological exercise. But uh, our that's our yeah. Reinform the, the database, you know. Yeah, it. that's a fantastic question. That's my favorite question. Actually. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was original. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've heard you ask before. <laughs> Uh, I, I, the reason I think it's so great is because the, this, this trial has been set up um, by about 150 people uh, worldwide. And these 150 people are neurosurgeons, neuro-oncologists, neuroscientists, basic scientists, blah, 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 blah. Uh, all, all of them have come together because the issue is that these patients die in about 12 months from diagnosis. It hasn't changed in 20 years except for one drug which changed uh, survival by about two months, and which itself is a mutagen. So that, that's unacceptable. But, so the, the, the issue is, how do, we, how do we use the genome data? That was your first part of your question. And of course we use the genome data, because uh, the, the most obvious targets are the ones which are most commonly mutated, even if we have to use a couple of those. Do you, do you have ongoing biopsy then? Yes, so there's, a, there's, a, there's ongoing biopsy, ongoing uh, radiologic screening uh, for, for the transition, like in the case of the uh, acquired immune uh, resistance. That, um, so that, that, of course, is going on. And, and there are inclusion criteria which have to do with genetic lesions and so on and so on. But the most interesting part to me is not that. The most interesting part is the second part of your question about whether what happens in the trial will inform back to the beginning of the trial. That is, would the trial provide the substrate for scientific inquiry that then affects the, the, the conduct of the trial from the 
begin? And the answer is yes, because what is being done is that these patients um, are being uh, are being are being sampled as as um, as Mary Claire asked over time uh, on drug before drug on drug after shifting to a different drug, for example, you can't sample a hundred times, but a, a few times, um, and those and those samples are all being stored in a in a manner which is consistent with all of the best practices and, and all that stuff, which means that at the end of the day, the the scientific the, the, the materials for scientific inquiry from a different angle are available to people who would never be able to do it. Uh, astronomers, for example. We have a lot of astronomers who are interested in this because of the Big Bang theory. They think that uh, GBM might be a, a, a smaller version of the Big Bang. Uh, economists. There's, there's a whole variety of people who couldn't possibly apply their, their, um, their approaches and their way of looking at things to this disease because they don't have access to it. So I, I think the answer is that we this will inform both upfront and in, in reverse. It's a great question. I, I think that is really the hope of the, the way it's being designed. Yeah. 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 Ye